Our next speaker, Anthony Lowther, electromagnetic specialist with Maya Heat Transfer Technologies, will be presenting on the optimization of an electric motor across multiple physics domains. Welcome, Anthony. Right. Oh, cool. That works. You can all hear me. All right. So I guess that was a nice introduction. So pretty much we're going to dive right in. I realize that we're a little bit behind schedule, so I'll try and keep this a little bit quick. Um, just to introduce myself, um, in case you can't see me from the back of the room, that's my face. Um, so I work at my, my HTT. Um, I'm one of the electromagnetic specialists there. Before my time uh, with them, I actually worked with Infolitica and uh, then Siemens, when Siemens acquired Infolitica. Um, I went to McGill and the University of Southampton before I got dragged into this electromagnetics world. So for those of you who don't know who Maya HDT is, we're a Siemens partner. We're the top Siemens partner in North America, certainly for electromagnetics. Um, so we both sell Siemens tools, support them. We have an in-house development team who develops a bunch of their tools. And we also provide things like consulting services, AI, machine learning projects, et cetera. Um, we're a pretty small company, well, medium maybe, at about 200 and something people these days, the vast majority of whom are engineers, scientists, what have you. So as for the actual presentation today, we're going to start by introducing just some of the physics domains that you might be interested in when you're looking at uh, motor simulation and pick out the ones that we'll be looking at today. Uh, we'll go over the uh, electric motor development process, sort of the stages you might go through, and I'll, I'll point out where we're really going to be focusing in today. We'll go through the optimization of an electric motor model, so automated optimization using the Siemens tools. Uh, we'll take a look at how we did some uh, some thermal design. Unfortunately, we, we didn't get as far as optimization on that particular step for this demo, just in, in terms of how much time we have. And, and we'll touch on multi-physics sort of expansion, how, far, how you can go further than just electromagnetics and thermals. So to introduce the platform that we're using, the Siemens sim, simulation platform, it's a set of products that fall under the SimCenter banner. So everything we're using is all under the same product set. And the whole point of using these tools is they all talk together. They all communicate really well and work together. Um, the benchmark uh, tool that we have here is SimCenter 3D and covers tons of physics domains, way more than we really have time to deal with. So when we're talking about motor design, there's four real topics that we're concerned about. Obviously, the electromagnetics, that's driving the whole system. Electromagnetics are going to define the losses. They're going to define the performance characteristics, the mechanics. Everything stems from here. We're also today going to be looking at thermal. Now, thermal behavior of a motor, as motors heat up, cool down, the performance characteristics change. We can see changes that could be permanent or temporary. And beyond the scope of today, obviously, we got lots of forces flying around in a, an electric motor. These forces are going to distort things. They might move things. You might want to do mechanical analysis if you're designing an electric motor. And beyond the mechanical analysis, you can drive out to acoustics, which are more and more important as we're looking at electric vehicles that you're exposing consumers to motors. You've got more and more motors in houses, in shops, where we actually care about how loud they are. And of course, in industrial environments, we care about how loud they are for safety reasons. Now. Most of you will be familiar with motor design, but sort of a refresher, and for those of you who don't go into multi-physics too often, why is cooling or thermal characteristics of a motor so important? Now, as a motor heats up, we, especially with permanent magnet machines, can see a massive decrease in performance. Um, and there's just one example here where just a 60 degree increase led to a 30% decrease in torque performance, which is pretty massive. And as temperatures rise, we also put our machines at risk of other problems. Possible permanent damage, extreme temperatures could lead to demagnetization or could damage windings and insulation and the other materials 
in the machine. Once you damage these components in this way, often it's irreversible. You've now just scrapped the machine or lost that performance permanently at a minimum. When we look at how we can simulate cooling, we've got a number of different ways. We're always gonna drive the from the losses in electromagnetic simulation. So you run that initial simulation, we know how much sort of waste energy is going around. Almost all of it is gonna be in heat. We can take those loss numbers and do a rapid thermal analysis, and this could be in the form of a thermal equivalent circuit or in uh, basic heat analysis using transfer coefficients, and these will be sort of in the orders of seconds to minutes for a quick rough idea of what a machine might perform as and how hot it might get. The problem with these is that they are often template-based, fairly limited in how complex they can be, and so they don't really represent reality. To represent reality as best as possible, we need to go into computational fluid dynamics. That often requires a 3D model. It's more complex in terms of computation time. So it's a trade-off. We can be quick, but not so accurate, or we can go for the full model. That's gonna suck up a lot of time. And yeah, if you've got a nice 3D model, you can get cool graphics as well for nice presentations like this. So the motor development process. So we've always got sort of stages as we go through from operational requirements all the way to, through to an advanced multi-physics design. And all these different stages from initial design through detailed analysis and multi-physics analysis all gets tied back often to prototyping and real world test and verification. One of the key features of working within a single environment such as SimCenter is that we can feed data from more detailed analyses back into the earlier stages so we can adjust our requirements and our expectations or our designs to suit our needs based on later validation and testing. We have tools within that tool set we were talking about, SimCenter, that cover all of these. Today, we're really focusing on Come on, there we go. We're really focusing on the initial design tool called MotorSolve, which is a template-based design f tool for, machine, for electric machines, motors, and generators. And we'll be looking at SimCenter 3D for some CFD analysis. We're really just focusing in. We're just gonna skip over the detailed electromagnetic analysis in, in SimCenter Magnet, just to keep things brief today. When we talk about automation for the optimization, we're gonna be using a tool called SimCenter Heads. I know I didn't put the title up here anywhere, but this is all about this block in the middle here, which is a tool in the SimCenter ecosystem that doesn't do any simulation on its own, but is entirely there to help connect uh, different tools together and to help automate exploration and design space searches. So in this case, we can connect it to our different tools, our electromagnetic, design tool MotorSolve and to SimCenter 3D, our CFD tool. Using these, we can explore lots of different options for designs without having to manually sit there and revise, build new prototypes, type in new dimensions, et cetera. So we're about halfway through our time slot. We're gonna get into the thick of things. We have a couple stages to this workflow. We're gonna first look at an initial motor design, and this is based on a motor design that we already had in-house from a previous project at MyHTT. And we're gonna look at how we set up the HEADS tool for optimization, and sort of the design space, the, um, the optimization goals, the constraints, et cetera. After that, we'll review the results of that, look at how we put this into a thermal model, and validated that, the new results, using the information from the thermal model. So when we're building this motor design out, typically we're gonna start with some specifications. We're gonna define the initial geometry and basic parts such as you know, number of slots, number of poles, winding characteristics, materials, what have you. We can then get a little more into the design where we're talking about setting up things like coils and whatnot and drive cycles. And then we can run analyses. So we can run basic EMAG analysis, and this will give us performance pure performance characteristics. And MotorSolve has the capability to do some, some of those very basic thermal analyses that we talked about earlier, 
where we can do some heat transfer coefficients and just get a rough idea where our motor's performing. All of this can be tied back, as we said, using the optimization tools. So based on the results of a single design, we'll go and adjust, or the res from the results, we'll go and adjust the design or the, defi the geometry definition to sort of hopefully improve our motor design. So our initial model, as I said, this was based on something that was already, we had available to us as an eight pole 48 slot machine. We wanted it to run at 30 kilowatts um, at 5,000 RPM with at least 95% efficiency. The magnet temperature here um, was a goal based on some pretty minimal thermal characteristics that we had in here. We wanted the motor solves thermal analysis to keep the magnets cool, but the, the cooling that was applied to this motor was just a little bit of airflow over the housing rather than the water jacket that we'll be looking at later. So this is probably an overestimate. We just wanted to make sure that we didn't allow any models that had thermal runaway problems. <clears throat> now, we had uh, a couple parameters that we were allowed to play with. We're allowed to play with magnet width and depth, so the magnet geometry, the cavity geometry for the magnets that they're embedded in, and uh, the rated current, just to give us some leeway up to about 380 amps, which was the limit of our controller that we were playing with. So we wanted to maximize our power and torque. We wanted to keep that efficiency pretty high, ideally better efficiency, and that means minimizing the losses and the temperatures in the magnets. Those are obviously pretty related. Less losses, less heat buildup. We said we wanted to keep the current under 380 amps, as that was the restriction on our uh, drive electronics. And we left some geometric constraints in those magnet cavities in the magnets, just so we didn't have too big a design space for the allotted computation time. Now, this, ran, this automated cycle ran through about 60 uh, different magnet configurations and motor designs, and you can see it sort of flipping through them here. And towards the end, it arrived on an optimal design. It was actually about the 58th or 59th design that it tried, that it determined to be optimal. Now, we'll take a quick look at some of the um, insights we could have and, and what the final design looked like. So we're gonna use both HEADS and MotorSolve when we look at this. So as for the uh, initial setup, uh, we said it was based on initial design, uh, but if you were bringing this from scratch, you know, you had something on a, a data sheet or some other requirements, this is typically something that takes a couple hours at most for an experienced designer to build this design, make sure they're, they're happy with an initial guess. The study setup, we used a, a portal. Uh, that's a bit of code that's inside of our optimizer that knows how to read in the files from MotorSolve, and it automatically tags all the possible input characteristics, output characteristics, constraints, what have you, and makes it really easy to sort of go like, oh, these are the parameters I want to adjust, these are the parameters I want to optimize. That took, I think it took me about 15 minutes to set up all those. And then we can choose our exploration strategy. We can try for an optimization, we can just do a design study of exploring the space, finding our trade-offs. <clears throat> In this case, it was just a pure optimization using um, a patented exploration technology. From there, obviously, we got our inputs, our outputs, everything was pre-tagged, nice and easy. And we ran, there we go, 61 variants were explored. And this took about 19 hours. Um, so it was about 18 minutes per design, give or take. Some were a little longer, some were a little shorter. You can see in here that some of them were deemed invalid. Those are just geometries that didn't meet our constraints. Um, so magnets get too hot, torque was too low, what have you, and a couple bad geometries. The red ones are just where the software throws, uh, hey, you put in a bunch of parameters where you've got overlapping components or for some other reason, it's invalid. Um, in these analyses, we actually ran two analyses because we were running both electromagnetic and thermal. So our 18 minutes was per, for two simulations per design. And we limit ourselves to a single license running on a single core on a five-year-old workstation at about three gigahertz, just to give you an idea of how long this took. We could parallelize it. We could use more licenses, more cores, more workstations to parallelize this whole process and make it a lot quicker if that was a concern. 
When we get to the outcomes, we can take a couple insights from some neat graphics that HEADS provides us. Things like we could see some pretty massive correlations. This is just a correlation chart between inputs and outputs. We can see some big correlations. Things like magnet width correlated really highly with efficiency. And your magnet thickness and ma magnet temperature were pretty related. Lots of thickness, it was a cooler magnet. <clears throat> and we've got other insights that we could see. The magnet cavity basically didn't make a difference to our particular chosen performance. This chart just shows correlations between inputs and outputs. So we got some outputs to inputs, and we might be curious how they relate. This correlation chart just says that you, know, you might have a, a direct relationship or an inverse relationship, whereas one gets bigger, one gets smaller, and how tightly tied those relationships are. And you could spend days just exploring some of this data that comes out of HEATS. But we don't have days, we have about eight minutes left. So after those 60 odd designs, we came out with a final design that saw our efficiency boosted a little bit, but the big one here was the output power went up 44%. We lost about 10% in losses, which meant that our losses were fairly similar in terms of order of magnitude, but we're now producing 44% more power, which is, a, I think, a pretty good result overall for this. How I set up the study uh, was sort of heavily biased towards increasing output power rather than increasing efficiency or loss or decreasing loss. Once we had all this data, we were able to go build a CFD model. And this was done by taking our initial solution out of MotorSolve, extracting two important components the geometry profile in a DXF format in, in the case that we used, and the loss data, which is just the tabular data of loss based on individual components. By extracting that DXF file just on a linear extrusion, we're able to build the core of the motor and put an aluminum uh, water jacket housing around it, which is gonna act as our cooling mechanism. In this case, we only modeled the core of the motor just to keep things simple, avoiding the extra complexity of adding end windings and a, house, and a bigger housing. But these could easily be added. MotorSolve actually provides 3D export, so you could grab a 3D model, including end windings and everything, and import that through to your SimCenter 3D environment, which is where we're building our geometry. We can then take our loss data and apply that onto the different components in our model and set up our experiment. So things like boundary conditions, flow rates, et cetera. So just a couple things that our CFD guy was kind enough to provide me with. Um, we were able to reduce the size of the model pretty massively by just symmetry. We could simulate about a quarter of the model and get an accurate result. Um, that means we cut down the computation time to something reasonable. In this case, we had almost 20 million cells. It's a fairly big model, but that means we're gonna get fairly accurate results, and we're gonna be fairly confident that they're correct. Um, we had a, a K epsilon turbulence model, some boundary layers. I don't know how many people here are CFD experts or if this is all, like to me, most of this is, is a bit of gibberish. Um, I swear they've told me what this means. Um, anyway, the important bit here is that we ran this on one of our more powerful workstations and it took about 11 hours. And this is why we chose to decouple the CFD from the electromagnetic optimization. Electromagnetics, you're talking about a couple minutes per solve. We can run through, as we said, within a day we ran through 60 different iterations. If we gave a day of computation time to this, we'd get through two iterations. There's no point in wasting cycles on CFD until we have our electromagnetics in this particular case. And we determined that when we ran an initial run of this and went, oh boy, that's taking a couple minutes to run. There's a couple boundary conditions. I guess the important bit here is that we're cooling it with room temperature water, um, basically into open space, 101.3 kilopascals. Uh, we could, we simulated the rotor spinning at its rated 5,000 RPM. Uh, and that makes sure that the, temp the heat losses that are coming out of the rotor are, are being distributed appropriately and that we're taking into account the air gap um, cooling effects on the rotor. So we applied the heat losses. Now we have two sets of numbers here. 
pre-optimization, we had just shy of two kilowatts of loss in here. Uh, afterwards, we had about 1.7. And because the loss numbers were doing a 2D simulation, we're just getting bulk losses. We're not getting a distribution within the components for this case. So we distributed these losses based on volume to the individual components. So we've got a ton of slots or a bunch of magnets. We're gonna take the total losses for the, the, slot, the windings or the magnets and we're gonna distribute them evenly to all these different components. Because hopefully at 5,000 RPM, the losses are pretty much evenly distributed. <clears throat> now, taking a look at our results, I've got a big yellow flag there saying I'm running late. Um, we saw a pretty modest reduction in temperatures. We're looking at a couple degrees Celsius for any of these temperatures. Uh, the largest gains were in the magnets and the rotor components, and that means that we could probably drive this motor a lot harder than we intended. This cooling jacket was more effective than we had initially realized when we designed it, and so we could probably find a way to drive this motor a little bit harder since we're floating sort of hot, but not scorching hot temperatures on our motor. And of course, the important bit at the end of the day is to tie all of this back. Temperatures in the motor massively affect performance of the motor. So we need to take those values that we calculate at the end of the day from the CFD analysis and feed that back into our electromagnetic model. So we are gonna take, we're gonna go back into MotorSolve. We can grab all those individual temperatures and rerun the simulations. Now, what we'll see is that our performance improvement was actually greater, because not only have we designed a better motor through our design, we're now cooling it better because there's less losses, and our performance gains are even larger between our pre-optimization geometry and our post-optimization post geometry. So from here, if I were a motor designer moving on to the next stages of design, which might be a more detailed electromagnetic model or um, further analysis in maybe mechanical or acoustic, simulations, I'm pretty confident that we're not gonna have any thermal problems going forward on this design. And of course, this is all under the Siemens Sim Center banner. All these tools talk to each other and we could pretty easily have run this same simulation from starting from the same electromagnetic standpoint to any of the thermal CFD, which we looked at, but also to mechanical and acoustics and all of them will communicate through our optimization system and allow us to optimize for any parameters that we choose. <clears throat> so in review, we looked at a couple different physics, chose two of them, looked at how we might design a motor. Again, we're gonna, we skipped over the detailed electromagnetics, looked mo mainly at a template-based electromagnetic tool, doing some 2D simulation, and a 3D CFD tool. We optimized the motor design to make sure that we improved our performance, and we saw a huge gain in torque for a little bit of, lo little bit of loss improvement. That was a pretty good outcome overall. We had our thermal simulation, how we quickly could take the data from our electromagnetics, and a couple minutes later, we're providing a CFD tool. Ran that for a day and came out with some pretty good results that we could then correlate back to our electromagnetic simulation. And of course, all of this can be played out in any different domain that we're interested in. So if you have any questions, I mean, here's some contact information. Give me a shout. Um, if you have any questions now, I'm happy to, or you can come find us at booth 108 over by, I guess, snack bar and tomorrow morning's breakfast bar. We've got a bright sign. It's all lit up in orange. You can't miss it. Um, yeah, so open the floor. Any questions, any comments? You have about 45 seconds. Does your simulation allow for the inclusion of the previous talks results, the Brockhaus measurements um, of, of the materials that you're using for losses and, and uh, permeability changes? So, um, I'm not a materials expert. I'm gonna put that out here first. We do have the capability to change the material properties, so when we build out our electromagnetic and our thermal models, we can change those proper, the material properties. There's an included database with some default ones, but we could adjust those. And if we had tested it, 
Um, you know, if you went and did a mechanical analysis and we found that actually because of the housing or some other thing, we're now under tension or we're under compression and our, um, we're gonna test our materials, find that new data, we could put that data in to our electromagnetic model and see how that responds straight in this 2D tool that we had. Anyone else? Cool, I think there's a group, of, a panel coming up here, so I should let them get on with it since I've taken up a minute of their time. Thanks, guys.